Hi there. This is one of my favorite motivational quotes. Sometimes, when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but actually, you've been planted. Let me show you what I mean. You see, the seed, when it is planted into the soil, everything becomes dark. And it probably thinks it's dying. But the truth is, it is preparing for seed germination, where a whole new beautiful world is waiting. So this is BioWorld telling you that no matter how hard studying can seem now, but after all that struggle, the effort will be worth it. So come join me to learn about the biology behind seed germination. Today's video, you're going to learn about the mobilization of nutrients after a process called imbibition. Following that, we will learn about the factors that affect germination. So let's start with imbibition. Imbibition by definition is actually a type of diffusion where water will absorb into a solid and then it will cause that object to increase in volume. Let me demonstrate. When we water a seed or we soak the seed in water, the water will be adsorbed. Notice here I use the word absorbed meaning that the water will enter the solid. But over here, I'm using the word adsorb, meaning that the water will actually just stick to the seed coat. So when the water sticks to the seed coat, it will slowly soften the seed coat and eventually cause the seed coat to rupture. And then the water will diffuse into the seed. That is where it is absorbed into the seed, which is a solid. Okay, it will actually diffuse through this tiny hole that used to be the micropill in the embryo sac. Now, once water has gone inside, what water will do is it will increase the volume of the seed. And this is the process that we call imbibition. So, as the seed expands, the rupture of the seed coat will also expand, causing the seed coat to fall off. Next, let's see what happens inside the seed in the presence of water. The internal structure of the seed has been introduced to you in my video on reproduction in flowering plants. So you should know that the plumule and the radical as well as the cotyledon and endosperm make up the embryo. However, it is the plumule and the radical that will grow up to be the young plant. The cotyledon in dicotyledon seeds and the endosperm in monocotyledon seeds will store nutrients that will be used by the developing embryo during seed germination. Besides that, you have the outer seed coat layer, which will rupture during imbibition, and the micropill is the entry point for water to diffuse in. Let me introduce you to another layer that is found just below the seed coat called the alluron layer. This layer is very significant during seed germination, which I will explain as we go along in the video. Now, in my video on plant hormones, I have introduced the role of abscisic acid. Abscisic acid is a hormone synthesized by the seed embryo to promote seed dormancy. That is, to prevent the seed from germinating. So, when water diffuses into the seed, what happens is water will actually dilute the abscisic acid, short form here I've used ABA, okay, and 
it will wash away the abscisic acid. Then, the water will stimulate the embryo to synthesize a new hormone, that is the hormone gibberellin. Short form, here I've used GA for gibberellic acid. In my other video on plant hormones involving cytokinin and gibberellin, I have introduced that gibberellin promotes seed germination. So let's see how that happens. You see, gibberellin will diffuse to the alluron layer. And what this hormone does is it will activate the genes in the cells of the alluron layer. Just like how steroid hormones carry out gene activation. So now, the alluron layer cells will begin to synthesize hydrolytic enzymes like amylase, lipase and protease. These enzymes then will carry out biochemical reactions to break down the stored nutrients in the cotyledon. So amylase will break down starch into glucose. Protease will break down stored protein into amino acids. And lipase will break down stored lipid into fatty acids and glycerol. These nutrients then will be transported to the embryo and the embryo will use up these nutrients for synthesizing energy, new enzymes as well as new cells so that the plumule and radical can begin to elongate. So this way seed germination will occur. We look now at the parts of the germinated seed. Earlier, I have introduced the plumule and the radical as well as the cotyledon. I just want to highlight another two labels, that is the epicotyl and the hypocotyl. It's quite easy to remember. Epi here means outer layer, just like epidermis, epithelium. So epicotyl is the layer above the cotyledon. Hypocotyl, I like to think of the word hiding. So hypocotyl is hiding below the cotyledon. Understanding of the word epicotyl and hypocotyl is important for a later part of this video. So now we know how seeds germinate. Now I'm going to show you two animations. And I want you to observe these two animations carefully and think of what are the difference between the animations. Okay, are you watching? Can you notice a very significant difference between the germination of the seed on your left and the seed on your right? Well, I hope you were observant. Let me explain. The seed on your left is germinating using a method called epigeal germination. Epigeal germination means the cotyledon is moving above the ground. You see, as it goes up, the cotyledon goes up. So how is it the cotyledon is going up? It is because the tissues below the cotyledon, that is the hypocotyl region, elongates. So please remember, if it is epigeal germination, it is the hypocotyl that elongates. So if you see here, the cotyledon is still inside the soil. It doesn't go out. So this is called a hypogeal germination, where the cotyledon remains below ground and this can only happen if the tissues above the cotyledon elongate. 
So, in hypogeal germination, it is the epicotyl that elongates. So, that's why I mentioned earlier, it's important for you to remember the position of the hypocotyl and the position of the epicotyl. So, we have learned how seeds germinate. Firstly, involving the process of imbibition and then followed by the mobilization of nutrients. Now, I want to talk about some external factors that can affect germination. After learning about imbibition, we realized that a seed just needs to be exposed to water to be able to germinate. But unfortunately, not all seeds can germinate that easily. Some seeds require extra conditions. What are those conditions? They are related to water, temperature, oxygen, and even sunlight. Let's look at each one individually, starting with water. Now, we already understand the basic need for water in germination. But you see, seeds that happen to be in deserts, even if you give them a little bit of water, they will not germinate. These seeds have very high concentration of abscisic acid. So when we put a little bit of water, that water is not enough to wash away the abscisic acid. The reason is because the seeds do not want to germinate in an environment that is so hot and does not have sufficient water to keep it hydrated. So seeds like this wait for a heavy rainfall where supply of water is ensured. Only then the abscisic acid can be washed away and the seed will begin to germinate. So you see, if you happen to want to plant a seed that originates from very hot climates, you will have to pre-soak the seed in water before trying to germinate it. Next, let's look at the case of temperature. Now, normally seeds can germinate around room temperature of about 25 degrees Celsius. But some seeds, like the seed here that is in a rainforest area, Although given water and given a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, may not germinate. The reason is because if they germinate, they cannot survive since the trees are too tall and blocking the sunlight. So they cannot compete with these adult trees. So what these plants wait for is a forest fire. So, when there is a forest fire, the seed is exposed to extreme temperatures. This will be a signal for that seed to begin germinating once the fire has ended. The reason the seed does this is because, firstly, the competition has been reduced because the adult plants would have been burnt. And secondly, the death of these adult plants will turn out to be fertilizer for the new plant. It's interesting how seeds also learn to survive. The temperature issue can also be considered in cold climates. So seeds that are in winter regions will also not germinate even if you give the correct amount of water. 
The reason is because if the seed germinates, it will surely die because there is not much sunlight to do photosynthesis and all the water has turned into ice. So seeds like this actually have to wait for a long period of cold, maybe like four months of being in cold temperature. Only then they will be stimulated to germinate because after four months it will be spring and summer where the sun is shining and the water is flowing. So seeds that are from uh, cold climates, you have to freeze them first before trying to germinate them. And earlier seeds that come from thick forest areas, you need to roast them first in fire before trying to germinate them. Next, we look at the role of oxygen. Oxygen has to be related to respiration. But in the initial stages of seed germination, the seed actually does anaerobic respiration known as anaerobiosis. The reason is because the seed coat is still present. The seed coat is impermeable. So oxygen is unable to diffuse in. So the cells inside the seed will have to carry out respiration without oxygen. But this is not for long because due to imbibition, the seed coat will rupture. So once the seed coat has ruptured, oxygen can diffuse in and now the cells inside the seed will carry out aerobiosis. That is aerobic respiration. So oxygen is not required in the initial stages of seed germination but is required in the later stages of seed germination. Final factor is sunlight. The role of sunlight is significant in germination of small seeds because if small seeds are planted too deep into the soil, the seeds are unable to germinate because they cannot reach the surface of the soil. So either the small seeds have to be planted closer to the surface or they have to wait for some unrest in the soil that will enable them to move up closer. So how will these seeds know that they are close enough to the surface of the soil? This is where the role of sunlight comes into play because the sunlight will help the seed determine the distance from the soil surface. So once the seed can sense sunlight, the seed will germinate and reach the surface of the soil. So remember, the sunlight here is not necessary for the photosynthesis of the plumule, but only important to help the seed determine its distance from the surface. Now I'm going to talk to you about a bonus factor, that is seeds with hard seed coat. Seeds like this are very difficult to germinate because the seed coat prevents diffusion of both oxygen and water. Therefore, imbibition cannot occur. Seeds like these are normally found inside fruits. So how they can germinate is by being ingested or eaten by animals. And then the animals will walk around in the forest and then defecate somewhere far away from the parent plant. And inside the feces here, you will find the seed minus the seed coat. This is because the seed coat has been digested by the enzymes in the digestive system. So now the seed can germinate. And to the seed's advantage, the feces will be its fertilizer. And since the animal would have defecated far away from the parent plant, the seed will have less competition. Now, if it so happens that you want to plant a seed with a hard seed coat, you don't have to go and eat the fruit and defecate. Instead, you can just take the seed and scratch 
the seed coat physically so that the oxygen and water can diffuse in. So you can see how seeds have adapted to a changing environment. So now, the story of how a seed dreams to become a seedling is ended. And the next story will be how the seedling dreams to become a tree, which you will hear from my future videos. Until then, goodbye.